It's down. Oh no. Oh. I hope these pens work. That's okay. I hope these work. All right. Well, so far, so good. Um, um, okay. So let me draw a picture. And then I'll explain what's meant by full frequency. Okay, so here's the boundary. Um, take a region, A, in the boundary. And uh, from that region A, define the causal diamond associated to region A. So that's the region where all the physics is determined by the quantum state of A. Sorry, good picture. Um, now take that causal diamond and um, aim it outwards. Wait, sorry, did I draw this picture already? The diamond? Uh, the end of the okay, this is, I think I already drew it, so let me go just go through it quickly. Um, this is the causal horizon, um, but the um, Rutaganagi surface extends out a little bit further, and um, the, so if we call this everything inside the Rutaganagi surface, region A tilde, then the claim of bulk reconstruction is that um, the bulk region A tilde uh, is encoded in rho A. Um, so, um, let me, so I, I think I drew this picture before, but I didn't really have time to, to explain it in detail, so let me try to explain uh, what's meant by that with a few examples. Um, first of all, what does it mean to be encoded? Um, well. It's the intuitive meaning of encoded in the sense that like any physics that happens in, in region A tilde um, is something that in principle you know about if you, if you know rho A. That's what it means to be encoded. If I try to give you a, a more like hands-on definition of what this means, it means that, uh, for example, there are bulk operators, like there's, there's some quantum fields living in the bulk here, and uh, there are bulk op say there's a bulk field phi, um, then there are bulk quantum field operators, which are local operators at these points. Um, and so like phi, call that x1, x2. There's operators phi of x1, phi of x2. And uh, the claim of bulk reconstruction is that these operators can be realized as operators in region A. That there's a CFT operator in region A that for all practical purposes acts like phi of x1. In other words, like if we calculate, we can, we can write each of these as CFT operators and then we can calculate their, their, the expectation value of those two operators and we should get the bulk two-point function uh, for these field operators between these two points. But are they necessarily local operators in the CFT? No, they're going to be non-local operators in the CFT. Okay. And um, it's important to distinguish between the, the things that are easy to reconstruct and the things that are hard to reconstruct. Okay. So if something, is, if something is here in the causal wedge, then that's something that's easy to reconstruct. So for example, uh, if I take this point all the way near the boundary, then there's a relationship that says uh, phi is equal to the uh, radial, to a rescaling by the radial coordinate uh, 
times the operator in the CFT. Okay, so as we take the bulk operator to the boundary, it just becomes identical to the boundary operator. That's the simplest case. But if we stay anywhere in this causal region, it's only a little bit more complicated. There's some smearing function, which is basically just a Green's function to the boundary. So you can um, sort of define this as, you can kind of shine it on the boundary and define a CFT operator that's smeared over this region here that, um, that gives this, gives the physics of the bulk operator out at this point. Um, when things get complicated is when you have operators that are not in causal contact with the, with the boundary, so these kind of operators that are contained in the entanglement wedge, so they're inside the Rutakanagi surface, uh, but they're not in the causal wedge. The way to think about operators like that is the way, like, why can you reconstruct the metal? Why do they, how, how can you access that region? And the answer is that uh, by acting with complicated operators in region A, you can actually move the causal wedge. So like, for example, if I, um, let's see if I can get this right. Um, I can act with some crazy operator that creates a, a, a shock wave here. And that shock wave propagates out into the bulk. And now when we define the, uh, now when we define this causal wedge, it's gonna be different because th that stuff has to, has to propagate through the shock wave. Um, so that, that's gonna move, the, the, the causal horizon is, is, it depends on what operators you act with. And if you act with a really complicated operator here at the boundary, you can uh, get the causal wedge to move out towards the entanglement wedge. And if you act with a complicated enough operator, you can find a crazy operator that uh, moves the causal wedge all the way out. So the way to think about reconstructing these operators out here is that you, you should imagine first acting with some crazy operator that uh, changes the bulk geometry and makes it causally connected. Then doing a simple reconstruction like we just described and then undoing the crazy operator. Um, so what, you, what you're gonna end up with is some crazy operator, doubly crazy operator. Um, and so in principle, you can access this region, but it's gonna be some complicated, some complicated non-local operator that does it. Um, let's see. Very nice way of thinking about bulk reconstruction uh, is with a, a tensor network toy model. Okay, so I briefly talked about tensor networks before, and I'm going to um, remind you what they are and write down this toy model. This toy model should not be taken literally, um, but I'll come back. There is a version of it that's literally true, so I'll come back to that. Okay, so um, remember matrix product states? I, I did them kind of briefly before, but a matrix product state is a way of writing a quantum state as a product of, of a bunch of matrices. Okay, so if you have a, a, say, a quantum state for a spin chain, where you just have a bunch of spins in a row, then uh, you can write that quantum state as a matrix um, with, or a tensor, rather, uh, a uh, tensor with three legs, uh, two internal legs, and one external leg. Okay, so the external leg runs over the physical degrees of freedom for a spin chain that would be up and down. Uh, the internal leg is just an auxiliary uh, index, and we said that you could represent the wave function by multi multiplying together a bunch of these matrices.
So each of these dots represents a three index tensor. The two of the indices are being multiplied in a row. Um, and the free indices are the physical ones. Those correspond to the actual physical degrees of freedom in the Hilbert space, spin up, spin down. Does this, do you remember this? Does this picture make sense? Do you remember the questions? Um, Could you explain again what the difference is between the internal and the external? Between? The internal and external. Yeah, so let me just write, uh, let me just write the state. Um, so this is, um, well, we can, uh, we can write a basis of physical states for the, actu the actual Hilbert space of the spin chain is, um, is this, where each of these takes the value 0 or 1. So this is just a basis uh, of spin up, spin down. And um, the, so if we expand in that basis, um, then we get some coefficient function psi. And what the matrix product state is, is it's an omsatz. You can think of it as a variational omsatz for psi. Um, that says that psi is a product of matrices. So it's M I1, I2, sigma 1, M I2, I3, sigma 2, M I3, I4, sigma 3, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so the, the internal lines are just there, they're just like put in by hand as part of the ansatz. Uh, whereas the external lines are uh, indicating the physical Hilbert space. Other questions? So the other thing to remember about matrix product states is that um, they are designed based on the encoding of entanglement. Okay, so in particular, like if I, if I cut the spin chain in half, then um, the entropy, so if I, if I cut this matrix product state, then the entropy of half of it, either half, because I'm assuming we're in a pure state here, the entropy of either half of it um, is bounded above um, by the um, number of auxiliary. So that let's see, how do I? Um, um, I always get confused about this log. It's either, so e each of these indices runs from one to n. These internal indices run from one to n. And the entropy is bounded above either by n or log n. Now I have to think about that. The number of states is bounded by um, by n. So the entropy is, is log n. Okay, so if the, if the, the indices i k run from one to n aux. Then the most entanglement, uh, the most entropy this this ansatz can encode is log n. So the more entanglement, the bigger the uh, internal space you need to introduce in order to get a good ansatz. So. Physically, so mathematically, um, this is just an ansatz with like a matrix, a bunch of matrices multiplied together. Physically, the way you should think about it is that uh, the uncontracted lines are the physical degrees of freedom. The contracted lines uh, encode the entanglement structure of the quantum state. 
And the bigger rank tensors you use, the more entanglement you can encode. Make sense? So, in a CFT, uh, a good way of thinking about um, the quantum state, the vacuum quantum state, the vacuum state of a CFT, um, is using a tensor network that's a lot like this, um, but I'm going to change one thing, okay? so. Um, Start with the matrix product state. Okay, now a matrix product state alone is not a is not a good way of encoding the ground state of a CFT. Uh, the reason for that is that S is this formula we derived. Um, that the entropy of a subregion goes logarithmically with the region size. Okay, so the problem with the matrix, with the matrix product ansatz, uh, if you take a subregion, say like this, then the most entropy it can encode is, is log n ox, which doesn't depend on the system size. You need a slightly different ansatz to account for that uh, logarithmic scaling of the entanglement entropy. And since it's logarithmic scaling, uh, what you can do is you can change this ansatz by introducing sort of a tree-like structure. So now we have Still, those dots still just represent a bunch of tensors that are multiplied together. You can think of it as sort of a quantum circuit. Um, and the, now, um, let's ask how much entanglement this can encode. Okay, so let's look at um, let's look at this region A uh, that I that I picked earlier. Okay, so to ask how much entanglement this, this can encode, you can read that off from the tensor network by asking how, how many tensor indices do I have to cut to remove that region from the network? Okay, because it's, let's, let's say we, we can cut that off the network um, with a cut that looks like this. Okay, so I, I cut through, I, I cut this index, well, I don't know if I want to go to the left or right of this one. It doesn't really matter. Um, let's go to the right. So we cut this index, we cut this index, we cut this index, we cut this one, we cut that one. Then once I've cut this piece out of the network, I have some physical degrees of freedom, and I have the auxiliary, the total number of auxiliary degrees of freedom is um, the, the total set of indices that I've cut. And that's the total amount of entanglement that uh, this ansatz can encode. And therefore, is the total amount of entropy uh, that this ansatz can encode for region A. So SA is less than or equal to um, number of cuts log an aux. Sense. So what did you say encodes the physical degrees of freedom? Which the physical degrees of freedom are the are these lines at the bottom. Oh, oh. the ones that are uncontracted. Because those are the sigma uh, those are the sigma one, sigma two, sigma three yeah. indices that, that, that 
go with the actual physical spins. So in general, this is just the most entropy that you can encode. So is this making sense? Are there other questions? Sort of. Yeah. Is there a reason for why this is the representation without thinking about entropy? No. Um, um, no, it's really just don't, it, it, nothing. Nothing's forcing you to use this representation. It's just the ansatz, and the entropy serves as a guide to understand what's a good ansatz and what's a bad ansatz. Like the matrix product state, it just isn't gonna doesn't encode the en enough entropy, so we use this instead. Yeah. So it seems like what we're leading to is saying that like the matrix product state. Per the tensor network representation of the quantum state as the vacuum of the CFT tells you something about the emergent geometry. Yeah. So, can we think of it as like space time and nature emerging from the entanglement structure of the quantum state? Uh, well, I. Or maybe space time and ADS. Okay. Yes. Space time and nature. It's less clear how general this is. But space time in ADS, yes. Space time inside a black hole, we're coming to that next next lecture, and also yes. Um, so that's well that's what I was about to say next. Now, um, I guess the a different question is like if I'm a person in this like in this Hilbert space and I just like look around me, like what makes it so that like my brain perceives it as this space time? Um, and what does that have to do with the entanglement structure? Maybe like the there's some like notion of locality when it comes to the entanglement structure? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, there's lots of things. Let me let me try to answer that as I go. And come back if I don't if I don't answer it. Because okay, so um, let me first state what the rough picture is. Okay, so the rough, the very rough picture, and there's all sorts of things wrong with this. So don't take this literally. The very rough picture is that that's the emergent direction in ADS CFT. Okay, so um, you should think of this as all being at fixed time. Uh, and this being the radial direction. Okay, so if I draw that uh, in a Lorentzian picture, where we have region A is some is some region on the boundary, then that tensor network is kind of living in the spatial slice, like this. Um, Uh, and encoding the structure into the bulk. And um, notice that the Rutakinagi formula uh, is basically what I was just describing with the cutting of the tensor network. Okay, so the Rutakinagi formula tells you that the entanglement, the von Neumann entropy of a region A is the length of the minimal area surface that extends out into the bulk, or the area of the minimal area surface that extends out into the bulk. Um, but you can think of that on the tensor network as being the minimal cut, um, the, the number of cuts that you have to make to remove it from the tensor network. There are all sorts of things about this that are not precise. First of all, space-time is continuous. Tensor networks are discrete, <laughs> so these dots like don't take them literally. Um, second of all, in tensor networks, the it's an upper bound. It's not it's not that it's not that it's equal. That depends on the details of the tensor. Uh, however, for sufficiently random tensors, you're going to saturate this upper bound. Um, so a more accurate way of saying it is that space time is like a random tensor network. And there are a lot of things work really nicely uh, with that picture. 
um, say that if the tensor network is like maximally efficiently designed for the state, then it'll capture itself. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, th there's a, it. Yeah, that's that's basically right. There's the issue that it might be efficient for this region A, but not for this region A. Okay, so but let me not get into that. Did you yeah. say that this whole issue with trees was only for the vacuum, or do you need for like arbitrary Well, um, the fact that it's a perfect tree is a statement about the vacuum, and the fact that uh, in ADS these lengths are logarithmic. Say, say we're doing 2D CFT, 3D bulk. These lengths are, are logarithmic when, when it's empty ADS, so dual to the vacuum state. But if we start adding matter in the bulk, that's going to deform the root Takanagi surfaces. It's also going to deform the structure of the tensor network. So that matches. So it's never going to be something that doesn't have any of these trees in the system that. Um, because then you wouldn't have a regular direction. Right. That I mean, the matrix, matrix product states are really only good for encoding gapped, encoding gapped quantum states. So states with no long distance correlation. In CFT, any reasonable state has correlation. I mean, yeah. At short distances, everything is vacuum. So at short distances, um, everything has to look like this. Uh, and what happens at long distances depends on the state. Um, okay, let me see if there's anything else I want to say about that. Oh, I have it. Yeah. Um, this feels sort of like deconstruction. Of yeah, the I know what you mean. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Deconstruction is a is a is, is roughly it's a discretizing of the radial direction in ADS CFT. I don't know if that's how you think of it, but that's one way of, of thinking about it. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't really have anything to add. Um, okay, so. One, uh, one, more, one more thing about this is that um, these tensors in the tensor network are encoded in the geometry. Okay, like the shape of the tensor network, that's like the shape of the geometry in ADFs. The fact that it's a tree is the fact that it's hyperbolic space. So near the boundary, there's a lot of space in ADFs. Okay, so the, the shape of the network is encoding the shape of the, ge of the spatial geometry. Um, however, there's also, like, the, the quantum gravity in the bulk is not just geometry, there's also quantum fields. So, like, there's quantum fields here, and maybe there's, like, uh, some EPR pairs uh, that are entangled with each other in the bulk. And um, we could ask how that is represented in this tensor network picture. And I wish I had some more colors at this point, but I don't. Um, so, roughly speaking, just think of that as like adding some extra entanglement. Okay, so like if there's a, if in the bulk there's an EPR pair entangled between here and here, you need, you need those two, you need those two locations to have a little extra, to carry a little extra entanglement between them. So the way you do that on the tensor network is just by uh, adding another, adding another line uh, where Say for an EPR pair, that, that line should have auxiliary dimension, auxiliary rank two, to encode the entanglement of that EPR pair. Yeah. So the magnetic complement is actually changing the geometry. Well, that's the weird thing, is that I think when, and, and this goes back to your question about locality and what it feels like to live in a tensor network. Okay, so. Um, there is, in a general tensor network, there isn't really locality um, in the sense that, like, th there's no, like, local theory uh, describing stuff propagating around on the network. Uh, this is some, 
feature that happens in large end CFTs and holographic theories with a holographic dual is that there's an emergent locality. And uh, in theories like that, there's a clean separation between two kinds of entanglement. There's the area law type entanglement, which is like the original network that I drew, and that encodes the geometry in the bulk. And then there's a, there's a different kind of entanglement, which is separated, which is the matter, which is like the entanglement of quantum fields, like these EPR pairs that we were discussing that are entangled in the bulk. The difference between, the, the, difference, the difference being that the area type stuff, that has entropy of order one over G Newton. Okay, so it's huge, because it's, the entropy is area over four G Newton. It's, Planck, it's Planckian. Whereas this EPR pair has entropy log two. Uh, no one over G Newtons. So there's this clean separation. Now you could ask, what happens if we start having an enormous amount of bulk, an enormous amount of matter entanglement entropy? Because now, you know, say we have not just one EPR pair, but one over G Newton <laughs> EPR pairs. Well, now things are getting interesting, and it seems that there is some sense in which that creates geometry. That the, the, there is no longer a clean separation between the geometry that was there in the first place and the extra geometry that you get from the entanglement of the quantum fields. And in some ways, they behave kind of the same. That's going to be crucial when we talk about the page curve um, coming up soon. Um, that when you have an evaporating black hole, you do get an order one over G Newton amount of this extra entanglement. And it makes you, so it forces you to sort of rethink uh, what you mean by this, by these pictures where there's the geometry that looks one way, but the entanglement looks a different way. Other questions? Yeah. Now, if, um, well, so like, Distance in the tensor network is measured by like how many bonds you have to break to get from one place to another. How many bonds you have to cross? Uh, yeah, it's how many, how, it's like how far you have to walk along the network. Okay. Um, now, okay, so my question is, like, suppose that I'm a person in this, in this, um, and I want to like measure a distance. So let's say that we're let's suppose that we're in ADS here, and I want to like measure the distance between myself and the whiteboard. Um, like maybe I do that by like sending some light there and measuring like, the time it takes for the light to come back or something. Uh, I guess I'm like. What is that? How am I probing like the entanglement between like the entanglement of the underlying quantum state by measuring that distance? Um, I don't know. I mean, di entanglement is area. Distance is not area, except in, in two plus one dimensions. Okay. Um, I I don't really have an answer to that. I don't know. There, there are various version. There are like similar version questions that are similar to that, like thought experiments. Like, how do I think of this in terms of entanglement? How do I think of that in terms of entanglement? That's like what lots of people have been doing for the last ten years: is is translating everything into statements about entanglement. Many things you can do. That particular experiment, like I, I don't have an information theoretic way of thinking about it. But I think it's. I think the intuition is correct that. There sort of is some underlying information theoretic way of rephrasing just about any uh, measurement of geometry, like including the one that you just said. Um, okay, so I kept saying that this was not to be taken literally, but um, so now let me say what's literally true. Okay, so what's literally true is that in ADS-CFT, um, 
the bulk is a quantum error correcting code. And for pretty much all like intuitive purposes, and I'm not going to get into the details of quantum error correction in these lectures, but for all like purposes of, of gaining intuition about this, I've never found a situation where you go wrong by thinking about the tensor network instead. Okay, the, the quantum error correcting code is a, is a more accurate way of describing what's really going on in the bulk, uh, but you can, it's, it's, it's very similar to what's going on in these tensor networks. Okay, so I'm only going to say very briefly why it's, what does this have, so what does this have to do with quantum error correction? I'm just going to answer that question, and then we're going to move on. Okay, so let me um, draw. This is space, and I've gone to coordinates where ADS is where the uh, ADS is is a circle or a, a sphere. So let's d divide space on the boundary into three regions A, B, and C. Now, um, for these. Three regions, we're going to draw the root Taganagi surface. So, like for region A, the root Taganagi surface maybe looks like that. So, if we know if if we know the physics of the CFT in region A, or we know the density matrix in region A, then by this claim of bulk reconstruction, we know everything there is to know about everything in this, in everything inside here, inside the root Taganagi surface. Okay, so A knows, so row A knows everything about this region. Let's do the same thing for B. So region B, um, say it has a root Taikonagi surface that looks like that, and we can use row B to reconstruct the physics in, re in, in that region. Similarly for region C, Um, and so now I want to ask, what's up with this diamond in the middle? This is a little weird, okay? So if I know all the physics of region A, I can get this region. All the physics, all, all about B, I get this region. All about C, I get this region. But what if I have, like, my friend is in here, and I want to know what my friend is doing. Um, so how do I reconstruct the physics in this, in this triangle in the middle? And uh, one way of answering the question is to say that, well, it's not encoded in any of the regions. So the only place that could possibly be encoded is in the correlations between, say, A and B, or, or maybe between A and C, or maybe between B and C. Well, let's ask which correlations it's encoded in. Well, for that, um, we should look at the bulk region, so let's ask if it's encoded in the correlations between A and B. So for that, we should look at the bulk region dual to row AB, the, the joint region, A union B. Uh, well, the root Takanagi surface for row AB is the same as the root Takanagi surface for its complement, because I'm assuming here we're in a pure state. Um, so row AB knows about my friend in the middle. So row AB can construct the diamond. So uh, yes, the, the physics of the diamond is encoded in row AB. But of course, this is totally symmetrical. So if it's also encoded in the correlations between B and C. And it's or also encoded uh, in the correlations between A and C. Okay, so the physics of the middle the physics of the interior is not encoded in any of these density matrices, but it is encoded redundantly in the entanglement between A and B, or between B and C, or between A and C. And that's what makes it a quantum error correcting code, because that's what quantum error correcting codes do, is they encode information redundantly in, uh, say, if you want to store one bit of information, you store that one qubit of information, 
uh, in the correlations among several qubits in a way where you can delete one of you can delete one of those qubits and still have and still know the information. So, like in this case, the uh, think of A, B, and C. We start. So, if I hand you the full physics in the full boundary regions A, B, and C, you have some protection against deleting the information in the diamond. Like you can lose, you can you can like misplace uh, any piece of this density matrix. Um, but as long as you kept enough of it, you still have access to the diamond. So that's like the error correcting code uh, feature. Um, that's really all I'm going to say about it, um, except to say that these are all things that you can, these are all things that are also true about this tensor network if the tensor network has some sufficiently generic properties like randomish tensors and, and, and that kind of thing. So um, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a formalization of this toy model of the tensor network. Questions? So the total state is pure, right? So that means the density matrix on region C would be the density matrix on region AB. Uh, it's not literally the same density matrix. It just has the same von Neumann entropy. In a pure state, the, the region and its complement do not have the same density matrix. They just have the same uh, eigenvalues in the Schmidt decomposition. Oh, they have the same eigenvalues, right? Yes. Are there stabilizer operators that you could use to like look for errors in the like protected space? I don't remember what a stabilizer operator is, but probably what's that? Those are uh, like serious code, error correcting code for a quantum computer. They're the operators that you measure in order to like try to detect and then later correct the errors that occur in your like logical qubit. Um, I don't know the. I'm sure the. I'm sure there are because it really is parallel in structure. But I don't know. I I don't know if that's something people have constructed or, or what. Um, what people have not really done is to use the bulk. So, OK, so no, you're, you're thinking from the point of view of a quantum computing perspective, um, where the point of a quantum error correcting code is to correct errors, <laughs> right? Because you have a quantum computer, and, and it actually literally has errors, and you're, and you're using the code to try to correct them. Um, people haven't really used this picture like in that way. It has the structure of a quantum error correcting code, um, but I don't. I don't know if there's a natural sense in which you should think of like errors occurring and then you correcting them. Like I haven't really heard people speak about it in that language. Like we don't usually like lose a piece of space time and then. So I, I'm not sure. I, I'm sure people have thought about that um, because. You know, a big industry the last five or ten years has been to read books on quantum information and take like everything you find in them and then, <laughs> and then see what they say about the situation. So, but I don't know. Can't you think of the reason behind the event horizon as being a reason it's been lost? Um, well, Sort of. Uh, yeah, we'll come back to that exactly that case next time.
Okay, so I don't know how other people approach this. Maybe it's not, maybe it's just me. But the way I think about it is I think about the tensor networks while keeping a little flag in my brain that like none of this is really true. And then whatever you conclude with tensor networks to try to rephrase it in terms of the more accurate language of the quantum error correction. And um, it had, it's, I don't know, it hasn't really led me astray yet, so maybe it's, it's, it's a good way of doing it. Um, okay. So there are two more things um, we're going to do in this course. Uh, the first is that I'm going to derive the holographic entanglement entropy formula for you. Um, it's going to be sketchy, so I, I'm not really going to do any detailed calculations. Um, what remains, but I want to sketch how this there, how the logic of this goes. In fact, you've already seen most of it. Uh, actually, there's only one step in this, it's all picture drawing until the very last step when you have to do a calculation. We already did that calculation when we derived generalized entropy. That was the application of the Gauss-Binet theorem. Um, so in fact, we mostly like already derived it. I just have to show you what I had, just have to draw some pictures for you and explain how we've already derived it. Um, the other thing we're going to do is is the island formula, which is the application to black holes, and we're going to do that next time. Okay, so let me proceed with this derivation of um, holographic entanglement. I'm going to take the case that A is a half space. The region A is a half space. That's just to make the pictures easier to draw. Uh, everything applies generally. So the Lorentzian picture is um, just like what I keep drawing, except now region A is a half space. So when region A is a half space, you can think of its, its other boundaries being at infinity. So the Rutakanagi surface is going to come out in the bulk sum. It's just going to come out this way and head off to infinity in the bulk. We're not in the vacuum, which is why I made this line kind of wiggly looking. Okay, there's there's like there's matter. Um, there's stars and stuff in this anti-sitter space that have back reacted on the geometry. We're not really assuming anything in particular about that matter distribution. Um, so this is the Rutaganagi surface, and our goal is to derive the Rutaganagi formula for the entropy. Well, we have to derive the fact that the minimal area or extremal surface determines the entropy, and we have to derive the formula for the entropy. So, as always, uh, we're going to calculate trace of rho a to the n and apply the replica method where we anal analytically continue n to 1 to obtain the von Neumann entropy. And we're going to do this by a Euclidean path integral. Uh, so the Euclidean path integral. is the statement that trace of rho a to the n is the gravitational path integral with boundary condition um, so the boundary condition um, well let me draw it Just n copies of Euclidean space which are glued together along region A. So 
So let me remind you where this picture comes from. So if we were working in the vacuum state, then this picture would just be the would would be the path integral representation of the vacuum density matrix on region A. And we're not in the vacuum state. So to account for that, we have to insert some sources into the Euclidean path integral. If you insert carefully designed sources, you can construct just about any reasonable state. And so we're going to focus our attention on those. We have to actually insert those sources twice, once for the bra and once for the ket. Okay, so you should think of the evolution from here to here as preparing a state at time zero. That's the bra. And then the other thing is the ket. Uh, so this first sheet of the Euclidean path integral, um, if, we were doing, if we were doing just quantum field theory, then uh, this first sheet of the Euclidean path integral would prepare rho A in quantum field theory. But we're not doing, okay, and, and then we need to do that, we need these J's on every sheet, twice on every sheet. So that would give us row A, and then um, we would do matrix, then we would have n copies of this row A, and the fact that we're doing matrix multiplication on those n copies of row A means that we should impose the same boundary condition on these two cuts and then sum over it, and that's what's indicated by these lines gluing them together. Now, if we were just doing quantum field theory, then, um, we would just do the path integral on this manifold. And in fact, we did exactly that when we derived the C over three log L. We, we didn't include the sources because we were working in the vacuum state, but that's exactly what we did in CFT to derive the cardi calabrese formula. We did the path integral on this crazy branched manifold. Now, today we're not doing quantum field theory anymore. We're doing quantum gravity. Um, so. The rule is not that we should do the path integral on this manifold. It's that we should do the gravitational path integral with this boundary condition. We don't get to pick the manifold. It's gravity. It's fluctuating. We don't get to pick it, but we get to pick the boundary condition. Um, so this is the Euclidean gravity prescription for calculating this trace row A to the n. Is that clear? Questions? Okay, so the, the, to summarize the strategy, we're, gonna, we're not going to literally do that path integral. It's too hard. What we're going to do is we're going to set up that path integral in such a way that it's analytic in N. Then we're going to take that setup, analytically continue the setup to near 1, and then actually do the path integral for N near 1. Um, I need to redraw that picture because I'm, it's, it's, I, I tried to draw a, a, a bulk geometry ending on that and it made my head hurt. So I'm going to redraw that picture in a way that I can uh, explain what the bulk geometry looks like. Okay, so um, what this geometry is, the boundary condition, um, you should think of this as, as being like n copies of the cut plane with these sources above and below the cut. Um, and this is a conical excess. So this is a conical defect, which is a conical excess, right? Because you have to go around n times. So a tiny circle will have length 2 pi n instead of, or 2 pi r n instead of 2 pi r. This is a conical excess, but it's hard to draw a conical excess. So I'm going to go draw a conical deficit instead. This is like a cone um, where, 
I'm going to put the, so if we, if we call this direction tau and this direction rho, um, then I can write this as a cone where the tip is at rho equals zero. And then uh, there's a cone with a circle where tau is equal to tau plus 2 pi n. Now again, the, the picture is really a conical excess, but that's sort of hard to draw. So I'm just drawing it as a conical deficit. But it's basically, it's geometrically very similar. The, everything is perfectly smooth and flat away from the tip, which is a conical defect point. Now, as we go, let's imagine that we walk around this circle. So we walk around the tau circle. We have to go around it n times to get back where we started. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to draw the sources on this cone. There's going to be two n of them. Because on the first sheet, we, we encounter the source twice. On the second sheet, we encounter the source twice, etc. Okay, so there's some... There's some radius here on the cone uh, where you're going to encounter these sources. And it, you're going to get a pair of sources, and that's going to happen n times. So there's two n blobs, uh, which are these sources where j is inserted. OK, so that's our boundary condition. It's this crazy looking cone with a bunch of sources inserted as you go around the cone. The pause? Questions? Does that make sense? Why do you call the sources boundary conditions? Uh, no, the whole thing is a boundary condition, not the sources. Uh, yeah. This whole thing is a boundary condition for the, the Euclidean design. path integral. The sources. Um, our sources, they're not, they're not boundary well, uh, no, they, they, they're not things that you like impose on the field at the boundaries, they're just things that go in the integral, right? Um, like they go, no, you can, you go, can, you can, the the no, they, they really are, they really are boundary condition, um, the, The um, the way you create stuff in ADS is to impose some boundary condition on the fields, like you set them, you set the fields to some value asymptotically. Um, I've kind of I've I've kind of skipped over this, but let me say very briefly how this works: is that quantum fields in ADS have a have a non-normalizable part and a normalizable part. The normalizable part you should think of as the ordinary quantum field, like that's the thing that you quantize with A's and A daggers and stuff. The non-normalizable part, that's more like an adjustable parameter that, that you think of as a source. Because if you change the non-normalizable part, you're now in a different theory. That's like in adding something in the path integral. So what's literally meant by this picture is that you have boundary conditions for the non-normalizable pieces of the bulk fields, and that's what corresponds to these blobs, and those, those are chosen in order to create the state that you like in the bulk. But they are just boundary conditions. They just indicate some particular boundary conditions on the bulk fields. Other questions? Okay, um, I need this picture to be bigger, so let me draw it again. Uh-oh. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, I'm not sure, I'm not going to draw the sources this time, just because it's going to it's going to fill up the picture. So let me not draw them, but they're there. Um, okay, so what is a three-dimensional? I mean, this whole thing is really in d dimensions. I'm just only drawing as many dimensions as I can. Um, but what is a geometry that fills in this boundary condition? Uh, well, a simple way of thinking about the of thinking about the geometry is to just fill in the cone. Okay, so the the at least topologically, I have, that's not the right metric on this space, but topologically, you could think of the. Uh, sorry, let me go back a step. We're going to evaluate this path integral by saddle point. We'll worry about quantum effects later. We're just looking for solutions at this point. So we're looking for solutions of the Einstein equation uh, that have a boundary condition, which is this cone. And one such solution, a simple one, is, is just filling in the cone. Okay, so filling in this cone, we now have a, a, a geometry in one higher dimension whose boundary is the cone, which is just what we wanted. Okay, so uh, the bulk geometry is the filled cone. And um, in particular, I want to emphasize that in this, in this bulk geometry, the only singular point is the tip of the cone. This is the only singular point. Within the bulk geometry, there are no singularities whatsoever. It's completely smooth, as it had to be, because it had to solve the Einstein equations. And the Einstein equations don't let you just go sticking singularities in the Euclidean manifold. So this is something that I've talked about before, like when we talked about generalized entropy. Um, but it's happening again here um, that the, when you do the replica trick, it introduces conical defects at the boundary. Where, or it introduces conical defects in QFT, but those conical defects get smoothed out by the Einstein equations, uh, in this case, away from the boundary. Okay, so everything is perfectly smooth. Um, and now what we're going to do. Um, is to think about um, a particular value of r. Okay, so let's say right here. This is like, I, sorry, I call it rho. So this is just some value, rho naught. Um, and then we're going to think about how the geometry gets filled in at rho equals rho naught. Well, it gets filled in by, by something with the topology of a disk, right? This disk is analogous to the Euclidean black hole. Uh, so if you recall, the Euclidean black hole the Euclidean black hole had a Euclidean time cycle of length beta. It had the topology of a disk. Um, and it had an R direction. And the Euclidean horizon was just a perfectly smooth point at the, at the tip of the cigar or the center of the disk. So on the cone picture, uh, there's a point here in the middle which is analogous to the Euclidean horizon. So the R direction is going out this way. Uh, now, that's a particular value of rho naught. Of course, we're really constructing this geometry at all values of rho naught. So the Euclidean horizon is not just this point here. It's a whole line of 
such uh, points. And that's the thing uh, which is going to be the QES, the quantum extremal, well, we're not including quantum effects, so let me call it the Rutakanagi surface. This is going to be the Rutakanagi surface when we take n to 1. At this, so far, I have not taken n to 1 yet. Um, so we're not talking about the binomial entropy. There's no RT surface yet. But the next thing we're going to do is take n to 1. Um, and that's going to leave a distinguished surface in the geometry, which is the, the, the tips of all these Euclidean black holes that go through and give us this, this surface. Okay, questions? Yeah. In that case, there were higher order domes also, so if they're analog with the You mean like from quantum effects? Or, yeah, or is the disk just the first order? Can you mean that in part of more terms? Um, yes, I'm about to write what this path interval gives, and, and there'll be extra quantum effects. think about this now is um, let's take that that data that dotted line the root talking service the, the RT surface here I'm going to call that chi and um, the way to think about this is that you fix chi and expand uh, near near n equals 1, and uh, calculate the action of that bulk geometry. And there's going to be two contributions. There's going to be the gravitate, as always, when we do gravitational path integrals, there's a contribution from the gravitational action. And uh, there's the contribution of doing the path integral of the quantum fields, which I'll just call ZQFT. So you fix your chi. Um, you do this path integral. And what you get is e to the 1 minus n times the quantity 1 quarter the area of chi plus SQFT. I kind of talked about this before when we were doing generalized entropy. As you can see, a lot of the same things are coming back. I'm not going to attempt to calculate this. You'll have to take my word for it that this is what you get. But let me convince you that, that you've basically already seen the first term. Okay, so when we did generalized entropy, we derived that first term. Uh, remember, by taking the difference of various cones and rounded cones and pointy cones, et cetera, and we derive this error of a 4. Um, the only difference now is that uh, there's no symmetry in the tau direction. Okay, there was a, when, we, when we talked about, jet, about a stationary black hole, there was a symmetry, a, a rotational U1 symmetry in the tau direction. Um, but actually, the way I did that derivation, that symmetry wasn't needed. So exactly the same thing works here. It's exactly the same. We've, we've already done exactly the derivation of this area term. The SQFT term, um, well, that one's harder. But you can roughly see uh, why it kind of makes sense. You know, we're doing a, a path integral of the quantum fields on a geometry that looks a lot like a replica manifold. And so when n is near 1, uh, zqft gives uh, e to the 1 minus n times the von Neumann entropy, just for the usual reason that the replica trick in qft gives von Neumann entropies. It's a little more complicated than that. You have to get various extra terms to cancel. But that's how it works out in the end. So this is what you get. 
Um, now, we're not done. Uh, this is an off-shell effective action because uh, I started by saying that we fixed chi. But in fact, chi is a choice. Okay, so um, the, to, get, to, to finish the path integral, we have to integrate over chi. So in the end, the calculation is that z of n over z of 1 to the n is the integral over the choice of chi So we do a path integral over all, all possible choices of chi of uh, this effective action, um, x1 minus n times uh, that thing. So let's call that thing, um, well, we don't have to call it anything. It already has a name. This is the uh, generalized entropy of the region that I called A tilde before. So let me write it. S gen. So A tilde is the bulk region that goes out to the root Takanagi surface chi. The general, so the definition of, of this generalized entropy is just the, the same thing that's written in the exponent here. It's an area term plus a QFT term. And the last thing we need to do is that choice of, is, is choose this uh, surface chi. Um, so that's just going to extremize over the choice of chi. Um, so this is going to be x. 1 minus n s gen of a tilde, uh, let's call it star, um, where this extremizes s gen. And finally, the von Neumann entropy is s of rho a is 1 over 1 minus n log trace rho a to the n as n goes to 1, which is therefore s gen of a tilde at extreme. And that's the root Takanagi formula, including the quantum corrections. It's the quantum extremal surface formula. So the last part was kind of sketchy, but I hope I gave some flavor for why you expect that to be the answer. Um, questions? What does this uh, derivation assume about the bulk geometry? Like, are you assuming that it is connected or it can have disconnected pieces? Um, I mean, simply connected or just connected? It's, I mean, I don't think it's assuming much of anything. I mean, um, if the bulk geometry has some topology, then um, that's going to tell you the homo that's going to give you the homology, homology condition that tells you where where region A tilde is allowed to, or sorry where the Rutakanagi surface is allowed to be it has to be it has to be homologous to region A. Um, yeah, sorry, that was my question. How do you derive the homology condition? Uh, it's yeah. built into these boundary conditions. is It's quite tricky to see that, uh -huh. um, but you can see that. Um, requiring the correct boundary conditions on the replica manifold does give you the homology condition um, if you have a bulk with interesting topology. Um, I would say the main, I would say the, the main 
some assumptions that there are definitely some assumptions going into this. So one is that uh, is that we can treat all the replicas identically. Um, so um, that was really essential to be able to analytically continue in N. You could imagine situations where the different replicas, where there's a saddle that's not replica symmetric. And that's difficult to deal with, um, and we haven't accounted for it here. Um, I would say that's the main that's the main thing. There's other assumptions going in, like whether what the asymptotics are at, 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 at large index in order to be able to do the analytic continuation. Um, yeah. One other uh, caveat that I should make here, and then, we'll, and then I'll stop for today. So the last caveat I want to make um, is that Um, this derivation was not microscopic. So what I mean by that um, is that we use the replica method so Let's say the answer we got is, is let's call that, let's call the answer we got the, the replica of von Neumann entropy, S replica of rho A. But uh, because of the way it was derived, claiming that this is the actual von Neumann entropy of rho A, the, like this is a big matrix that we want to take the log of and calculate the trace. Um, this must be viewed as a conjecture. Remember when we talked about Euclidean path integrals in quantum field theory versus gravity? In quantum field theory, it's just true that the path integral computes the trace, the trace for you. In quantum gravity, that seems to be true uh, but it's sort of a conjecture. It's, it's, a, it's a consistent picture. Everything fits together great. But there is not a first principles derivation uh, that the Euclidean path integral that we've done is really calculating trace of row log row of some row. There's no first principles derivation of that. I think to have a, a true derivation of that fact, you would need a UV completion of quantum gravity. You would have to do it in string theory or something. Because this matrix row A, uh, you definitely cannot calculate that matrix using the Euclidean path integral. It's just not, it's, it's impossible. It's not, it's not something you can find in the low energy theory. It's UV sensitive. It's a microscopic detail. Um, what seems to be true is that the Euclidean path integral is smart enough to be able to calculate this trace, but not smart enough to know row A itself. Since we don't know row A itself, I, I think we have to view that as, as, a, as a conjecture that we're collecting evidence for, as opposed to a, a, a full a full blown derivation of that phenomenon. Entropy. Okay, so um, Thursday we do islands. Friday, 10 a.m. presentations, um, and no lecture next Tuesday. Um, if I don't finish islands on Thursday, then I'm either going to take over the beginning of the presentation section on Friday, uh, so that I can, and I don't think I'm going to finish it. So I, I think I'm going to probably take over the either take over the beginning of the presentation section on Friday. I'll, my part will be recorded so that people can watch the video, and then we'll do like Q and A at the next presentation section or whatever. If people don't make it to this one. Um, or I'll have, um, I'll, or I'll have someone else do the uh, talk about it in lecture next Tuesday. I won't be here. I'll let you know. Um, okay. See you Thursday.